I'm Michael Perryman. Uh, I worked my entire career with the European Space Agency, uh, 30 years with the European Space Agency, leading two scientific projects, the Hipparchos Space Astrometry Mission. This was the first satellite put in space to measure star positions. And this followed in the mid-1990s with the follow-on to the Hipparchos mission called Gaia. And I was the project scientist for Gaia for almost 17 years. When I started my uh, work in astronomy, there were no exoplanets known. The first planets were discovered in the mid-1990s. And since then, the um, discovery rate of advance has been really enormous. 25 years ago, there were none known. Today, we have more than 5,000 exoplanets, other planets around other stars, which we know. And there's been an explosion of knowledge acquired on these planets from a variety of measurement techniques, measurement of radial velocities, measurement of transits as the planets pass across their host star, and an enormous amount of theoretical and explanatory work that's been gone into understanding these systems. So we've made uh, enormous strides in, in the last 20, 25 years. In the period since exoplanets were discovered, our knowledge of the formation and evolution of these systems has been really enormous. And I'd say that's come about from two very different um, directions. One, of course, is the discovery of the exoplanets themselves. And what we see there, especially from the mission Kepler, uh, a NASA mission which discovered thousands of planets, and they were extremely surprising in the diversity. We found planets very close to the host star. We found uh, multiple planetary systems. We found um, evidence for the migration and evolution of these systems. We found massive planets in large numbers and so on and so on. But the other thing that's really enabled the advance in exoplanet studies has been the work done in understanding our own solar system. So in the same period of time, I would say the last 20, 30 years, there's been a great advance in the understanding of our solar system. That's come about from ground-based observations, from satellites, uh, from interplanetary missions, uh, and an enormous amount of modeling and theory. And I would say in the last 20 years, we've made a huge leap in understanding how the solar system formed. That's been assisted by the work on exoplanets. And at the same time, we've made enormous advances in understanding exoplanets, which itself has been enabled by our ability to study uh, the solar system and the minor bodies of the solar system and all these kind of effects. So it's been a very complementary evolution in our understanding. And we're now aware of a wealth of uh, uh, strange planetary systems, um, strange dynamical effects, uh, enormous diversity in chemical composition and so on and so on. It's always dangerous to try and predict the future, isn't it? Um, but I'd say there's, there's, there's probably a couple of directions that are receiving a lot of emphasis. One, uh, people are very excited by the prospects of discovering other Earth-like planets. So there is a, a, an enormous effort going on into not only trying to identify these Earth-like planets, but also then trying to characterize their atmospheres, their, their motions, and, and so on. So that's one area of great, uh, of great interest to many people. And for example, the James Webb Space Telescope is being, um, is being used, will be targeted to look very carefully at these atmospheres to see, to see what chemicals are there, to what extent they resemble the Earth, and so on. Um, th there's a whole area of uh, many other areas of exoplanet research that are going to be very exciting in the, in the, in the future. Uh, I don't think we know very much about planetary systems that are like our own solar system. Our solar system is dominated by a Jupiter, uh, the, the, the gas giants, the icy giants far out. 
And of course, what's most interesting to us are the terrestrial planets closer to us. So we've seen evidence in the discoveries up until now of many massive planets, but there's not so many that are uh, analogous to our own solar system. I think Gaia will help enormously uh, in that respect in discovering planetary systems which have got a massive Jupiter out in a five-year, ten-year orbit. And then we can start to study in more detail what's going on inside those. Are there less massive planets like the Earth actually circulating in these systems? But there's uh, um, many areas where uh, we'll, we'll be hoping for a much better understanding in how these, how these very complex systems evolved. It's going to be very difficult to get an image of an exoplanet surface. That's certainly not to say that it's not possible. But what we know from that is that you need such extraordinarily good resolution uh, to get those images that you're going to have to have telescopes with an aperture equivalent to, let us say, hundreds of meters or more, even kilometers or more. The ideas for doing that uh, they're called free-flying interferometric systems, free-flying interferometers, where you fly a number of small satellites that replicate a much, much larger telescope. Those plans exist. They are on the table. The question is, uh, I think, how ingenious are the next generation of scientists going to be in designing these, launching these, and operating these? And how willing will our governments be in uh, coming out with the necessary uh, finances and support for these very, very challenging missions that lie ahead. So I, I think if our, our societies continue to support research, fundamental research, um, if society continues to support these kind of activities, then I think there are prospects uh, uh, proceeding step by step uh, along the path to getting images of other planetary systems. But it's not going to come in the next uh, five or ten years. Will we ever get direct, unambiguous evidence for biological activity on another planet? Uh, what an enormous question. I think, first of all, let's come to our own solar system. Let's come to our own planet. We, we, we don't see any evidence for any other biological activity on any other body than the Earth. Um, there are good arguments to say that the relevant environments may exist on other um, bodies in the solar system, especially the, ice, uh, the icy moons of some of the outer planets. But first of all, we haven't seen any of that even in our own solar system. The, the other point is that we don't have any really um, detailed, clear picture of how life originated on Earth. And depending on who you speak to, some people will argue that life is inevitable. The development of at least simple uh, organic life is, is, is inevitable. Others do argue that the uh, probabilities and the complexities of this chain of processes building up from the simplest organic molecules to some form of self-replicating life is already quite challenging. So the, this addresses a, a, que a key question. Are we, um, is life elsewhere common? Is simple biological life common? Uh, or are we alone? I think over the last few years, we've seen a big advance in understanding of what sort of signatures we should look at in terms of spectroscopy. Uh, for example, if we see oxygen, if we see ozone, if we see methane, simultaneously in the same atmosphere, this may be an indication that some sort of biological life is, is present. That's something we may see better evidence for in the coming years, perhaps with the James Webb Space Telescope. Does intelligent life exist elsewhere in the universe? My feeling is no. Others will argue yes. The simple answer is we don't know.